A very good evening to you all, respected doctors. It is indeed my pleasure and privilege to welcome you all on behalf of HIPCA for this very interesting and useful webinar on heart failure. For this webinar, we have a galaxy of national faculties. Today's webinar will be moderated by dynamic, vibrant, and energetic athlete cardiologist of the country, Dr. Chetan Shah, sir, from Mumbai. Then we have senior international cardiologist from Bangalore, Dr. Professor Venkatesh TK, sir, who is very active in CSI. And then we have a young and smiling cardiologist, Dr. Professor P. Manokar, sir, from Chennai. It's my honor to welcome and introduce today's faculties to you. First, I'll introduce today's moderator speaker, Dr. Chetan Shah, sir, to you. Chetan Shah, sir, is a director at Cath Lab Zainova Heart Hospital and Heart Rhythm Clinic, Mumbai. Sir is a consultant international cardiologist and rhythm specialist at Leelavati Hospital. Sir is also attached to Godrej Memorial Hospital, Kohinoor Hospital, Portis Hospital, and KJ Somaya Hospital and Medical College at Mumbai. Sir has experience of doing more than 7,000 angioplasties. Sir has more than 25 publications as a first author in international journals. Sir has written more than 50 abstracts presentation in international meetings also. Sir is a visiting professor of cardiology at Michigan State University in USA and has given more than 200 guest lectures at national and international meetings. Apart from this academic credential, few things which I know about, sir, is that he is a very good poet. Sir writes a good poems in Gujarati. He not only writes the poems, but he recites poems. He is a good singer. Sir is a marathon runner. He has run national and international marathons also. He is a good trekker. And he has a trek of Everest base camp also. So this is my proud privilege to introduce Dr. Chetan Shah sir to you. And sir will be speaking on topic that is management of chronic heart failure. Then our first speaker is Dr. Professor T. Venkatesh sir. Sir is MD, DNB card, FSCC USA, FSCAI USA and FSCC. Sir is a senior consultant international cardiologist at Apollo Hospitals in Bangalore. Sir is a president of Cardiology Society of India, Karnataka chapter. Sir is the ex-vice president, Cardiology Society of India, Bangalore chapter. Sir is a permanent member of research committee of CSI, Karnataka chapter. He is the executive committee member of Indian Academy of Echocardiography, Karnataka chapter. And sir is the ex-expert panelist on Lipid Association of India. And sir will be speaking on topic management of acute heart failure. Then our second speaker is Dr. Professor P. Manokar, sir. Sir is a professor of cardiology at Sri Ramchandra University Hospital at Chennai. Sir is awarded APJ Abdul Kalam Excellency Award in 2017. Sir has authored numerous national and international publications in accredited journals. And sir is a regular speaker at national and state level conferences. And sir will be speaking on the topic etiology and diagnosis of heart failure. So with this small introduction, I hand over the session to today's moderator speaker, Dr. Chetan Shah. Sir, please. Thank you, Avinash, uh, for those very kind words. Uh, I welcome uh, Dr. Venkatesh and uh, uh, Dr. Manokar uh, as my co-speakers. Uh, and without wasting much time, I, I invite Dr. Manokar, who is going to be our first speaker, uh, to talk on etiology and diagnosis of heart failure, an extremely important topic. So over to Dr. Manokar, sir. Thanks for the kind introduction, sir, and uh, warm regards from Chennai. So uh, uh, here uh, in the midst of all these things, uh, uh, it is nice to see you after a very long time. So let me uh, kind of uh, uh, be very brief and uh, try as much as possible to compress in the time slot allotted to me. Uh, in fact, uh, uh, the other time I was in one heart failure meeting, the moderator was so upset with me. He said uh, he will give the mic to me only the last uh, because he was worried that I'll keep on speaking uh, till everybody left the hall. You have been gracious enough to give me the first chance. So today when I was uh, looking at my topic, uh, I was uh, looking at uh, the you know uh, most successful run chases. So probably we are chasing uh, somewhere in that range today, trying to squeeze in all these topics within a 15 minute slot. So I hope that I don't upset many people, but uh, whatever little I can convey in this 15 minutes, I'll try my level best to do justice to it. Uh, 
the, this is uh, uh, very important because there are two, three important things that I will focus on. Uh, uh, the last two things will be taken up care by my senior colleagues, Dr. Venkatesh and Chetan Sattar. But I'll concentrate on the first three questions. Why heart failure is so important? Uh, how do you diagnose heart failure? What is heart failure? And the most important focus is going to be the diagnosis uh, modalities in heart failure. Dr. Venkatesh and Dr. Chetan Sattar will uh, discuss the other modalities and uh, uh, that will be, a, uh, uh, we can have a discussion at the end of the meeting. So sometimes when I talk about heart failure, people think that uh, I'm trying to uh, convey an impression that heart failure is more important than ischemic heart disease. Some way I want to convey an impression that heart failure is more important than diabetes. Somehow my obsession with heart failure is as if it is the only important disease in cardiology and uh, diabetology. But the reasons are, these numbers are staggering. So this is obviously a very old slide, almost a 15 year old slide from the United States. And if you look at the, in terms of uh, uh, number of people affected, the number of new cases and the number of deaths, and the most important thing in terms of Medicare expenditure, that is the treatment option given to people above the 65 years of age, uh, it is the largest diagnosis for Medicare expenditure. That means, in the US, if uh, money is sick, uh, logically we think cancer is the predominant reason for medical expenditure. But if you look at the US data, the largest Medicare expenditure goes into heart failure. And that itself conveys how important this condition is in terms of patient outcomes and treatment. So uh, this is again a very old slide uh, from uh, data from the uh, US again. Uh, and if you look at this uh, slide, you can clearly realize that uh, uh, practically it is the most common epidemic in cardiology. In this uh, corona pandemic, we forget that I still remember a very nice article by Eugene Brownwald in that at the turn of the millennium, uh, that is 20 years back. And he said that the only panned end epidemic in cardiology which is yet to be addressed is heart failure and atrial fibrillation. So that was his uh, remark 20 years back and even today his remark is important. And this is just to show how with age, the incidence of heart failure uh, keeps on increasing, keeps on increasing. And then uh, the older the population, almost like 10% of the population above 75 would be a patient with heart failure. So. Uh, So uh, it is not uh, very different in the, uh, 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 even if you look at the EU, so even in the European Union, heart failure is far bigger number than my, uh, all the cancers combined. So this is just, see, sometimes the way I talk, people think oncology is not important, but what I'm trying to uh, give importance is the public mindset. The public mindset about cancer is so scary and people believe that cancer is going to kill them. But if you look at the numbers, all cancers together is lower than heart failure. And in the U, uh, U is less than myocardial infarction, it's less than seven cardiac disease. So the point I'm trying to stress is heart failure is the biggest challenge of society today as far as cardiac is concerned. So this is a uh, um, very, very important thing that uh, very often people don't realize this aspect that uh, I, I, you know, why I always put up this slide is that if you, uh, if you think about, uh, uh, you want to take home one slide for uh, the, from the entire talk of my, that would be this slide. That is, once you have made a diagnosis of heart failure, what is the one year mortality? So if you have AIDS, leukemia, lung cancer, pancreatic cancer, pancreatic cancer received lot of attention after the Apple owner was found to have pancreatic cancer. So many movies have been made trying to highlight the fact that pancreatic cancer is a deadly disease. But why I put it up here is, if you have somebody with the end stage heart failure, uh, this is from NEGM, and this is not a new slide, it's almost a 20 year old slide, but unfortunately no physician believes in this slide. That's why I want each one of you to remember this slide, that somebody with end stage heart failure with optimal medical management is expected, survival is expected, to be around 50% max with all the treatment alternatives available today. And that's why I want this slide to be the number one slide for you to take home today. And for people in the audience who may think 
that okay uh, heart attack is a men's disease so heart failure is also a men's disease that is logical but we want to this is just to make you understand women especially older women when they have diastolic heart failure they have more predominant symptoms and in general they do worse with heart failure so in general if you uh, look at the mortality and outcomes so there is not much difference and women in general do worse than men so this is that is uh, the previous one was about the incidence but if you look at this slide mortality you understand that mortality with each hospital uh, uh, admissions and the this thing women do worse especially with diastolic heart failure and why why despite all this knowledge that you know heart failure is bad heart failure is uh, uh, in a lethal and all these things despite all these things why this is bad is the natural history of heart failure is very very unpredictable so uh, 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 conventionally we we when we uh, teach undergraduate post graduate we talk about natural history so if you see natural history of conditions say, say aortic stenosis and all we kind of tend to have a you know smooth graph but in heart failure this admission the admissions in heart failure are a lethal uh, uh, indicator that these gentlemen will not do fight in fact the doctor venkatesh as well as the chetan sir sir will be uh, emphasizing on how to prevent pre admission how to manage chronic heart failure but the point i want you to understand is every episode of admission ensures that that gentleman is likely to go downhill rather than ever come up on the No, so that that's a very very important message from this slide that every episode of heart failure we are inviting trouble. So this is again same thing. So even if if some somebody has we mentioned about you know prognosis and advanced heart failure unchanged in the last twenty years, stage B heart failure, invasive motor hospital, all these things we discuss. But if you look at uh, this thing, so suppose somebody has end organ acute cardiogenic shock. so the mortality is imminent suppose someone has end organ dysfunction like for example creatinine has gone up to 4 3 3.5 needs dialysis i know to depend it uh, 3 to 6 months uh, people who have ace intolerance these are all small small clues that you should be looking for it we will elaborate in the later part of the discussion but why i put it up here is to emphasize that this is all these things not tolerating oral therapy maximum one year people who are stabilized on nvt class 3 maybe they can pull beyond two years but otherwise people who have hypoxia who have one episode of hyponatremia these are all indicators that these gentlemen are not going to do well in the long run so this is just to uh, summarize that uh, how you can predict prognosis in heart failure based on the presenting things so so somebody you find is a central risk somebody who gets admitted with one episode of hyponatremia don't think you give him 12 uh, 12 aptan and he will be normal these are clues that this guy is going to do bad and that's why we need to uh, take them more seriously so to start off this is a very standard definition um, uh, of heart failure from the times uh, maybe the third edition of brown world this is been the standard definition the complex clinical syndrome that results from the inability of the heart to meet the metabolic demands of the body so this was the original definition of systolic heart failure to incorporate diastolic heart failure one additional uh, you know line has been added to the definition is uh, it is able to meet the metabolic demands of the body with elevated filling only with elevated filling pressure the concept of diastolic heart failure has been incorporated into the definition based on this uh, in, uh, finding so that is how we define heart failure so basically heart failure is a clinical syndrome so uh, each patient usually has symptoms of heart failure we have talked about breathlessness fatigue tiredness ankle swelling one of the senior professors of cardiology in chennai always told me that one episode of uh, one episode of uh, heart failure in patients is an indication of uh, uh, one episode of heart failure ca can be predicted in patients simply by one simple clue that uh, patients will typically given his case that uh, once they have a uh, heavy breakfast or lunch or dinner they just have to go and lie down this is a very small clue 
it may happen in lot of people with obesity osa and lot of other conditions but if you want to play pick up incipient heart failure this one symptom you should uh, pay attention to that's a very good symptom for you to uh, understand that this gentleman is the, is the potential candidate for progressive uh, incipient heart failure so uh, breathlessness at rest and most importantly fatigue immediately after having a big meal is a very typical and cardinal symptom of heart failure and signs the most clue important clue that i have seen in heart failure patients is the in, in, uh, absence of the what we call as the uh, uh, sinus arrhythmia pattern i know it, it doesn't happen in adults but very often there's a very important clue if you take as the patient to take a deep breath leave it take a deep breath leave it and you find that the heart rate is kind of static that means this guy has had significant autonomic deregulation and this guy is a potential candidate for sudden cardiac death having more likely to have events in the setting of heart these are very small subtle clinical signs which we can always pick up other objective signs we have always discussed but most importantly this thing uh, 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 you know extreme fatigue after food and uh, the uh, objective evidence in terms of uh, uh, autonomic dysfunction and the other clinical pictures is important so how uh, we have to first understand that the classification is based on two issues one is the ACCHA classification another is the NHA classification so what what does the ACCHA classification say is stage a is at high risk of heart failure so somebody having hypertension or ihd is stage a so stage b is somebody having a ef of say 50% 45% but has no symptoms of heart failure he had an anterior volume my pdc had done EF is 50 percent, but uh, anterior wall is hypokinetic. He has no symptoms of heart failure. So that is what is called as ACCAH stage B. In NYHA class, he will be called as stage one. We know NYHA class. I need not discuss it here again. But the point is, stage B uh, ACCAH corresponds to stage one uh, NYHA class. And fractional heart disease with prior or current symptoms, the, that would be the second thing. So similarly. Uh, class 2 this thing that uh, class d is unfortunately where the patient needs either uh, things like a crt or a consultation for a referral to a specialist heart failure team and also consultation for transplant so another thing that uh, we always uh, teach post graduates and undergraduates is uh, the concept of left heart failure so uh, this is a very important concept that left heart failure uh, can exist with right heart failure and right heart failure can exist with left heart failure you can have biventricular failure and also you can have a patient with a predominant left failure or a predominant right failure but one interesting thing was uh, denoted by uh, one uh, uh, cardiac anesthetist uh, in stockholm he evolved a concept saying that if the left heart fails and the right heart responds then those people are more symptomatic so this is a very interesting concept that is if somebody has left heart failure and the right heart responds by increasing the pa pressure those people are more symptomatic but if the left heart fails and the right heart also fails so what happens the fluid distribution is uniform in the lungs as well as the liver so in 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 a in a you know kind of a sadistic way if the right also fails with the left at the same time these people become less symptomatic so this is a very uh, you know controversial top um, statement by that uh, cardiac anesthetist but it's a point worth pondering if you look at your patients you may say why one fellow is more symptomatic for the same echo parameters or same finding uh, as compared to the other fellow who is less symptomatic despite having an echo finding which is more so the clue on all these patients lies in the right heart so the clue of uh, why these people are not doing well lies in the right heart so that is something we can discuss later so this is uh, just to uh, under, uh, understand the concept that your heart fails both due to free load also due to after load so uh, both these factors increasing free load or decreasing uh, increasing after load can lead to heart failure so uh, what is free load is basically the volume entering the ventricles and after load is resistance of the left ventricle so for example fluid overload is an example of free load um, aortic stenosis uh, other things is an example of a after load even severe mitral regurgitation is an example of a uh, uh, after load scenario 
so uh, so this is uh, basically how the uh, uh, preload is affected so if the volume of blood in the ventricular tend to be small the preload is more it depends on venous system depends on the lv compliance so afterload is depends on the arterial blood pressure so hypertension is a common cause of heart failure uh, in the elderly population simply because the blood pressures are not well controlled even people with increased pulmonary artery pressure also have the same afterload issues and they do not do well so uh, although we assume that ejection fraction is a, is the key in diagnosis of heart failure but we know that we have now newer terminologies we have terminologies heart failure with reduced ejection fraction heart failure with preserved ejection fraction and now the eac has introduced the term called as heart failure with mid range ef so somewhere around 40 and 45 so we should understand the ejection fraction is a percentage of uh, uh, blood that is but the most important thing is ef is not the important thing in diagnosing heart failure so systolic heart failure is obviously the most common cause of heart failure usually clinical symptoms occurring people with ef less than 40% and uh, uh, impaired contraction function skip all these things diastolic heart failure is an inability to the heart to relax and uh, that is uh, the the pressure skip this thing so we can have we uh, discuss these issues in skip so this is very important point because from here onwards the uh, the um, kind of treatment starts so heart failure with preserved ef would be 40% of the clinical practice whereas ef less than 60 40% uh, would be 60% of clinical practice so that's something you should remember so how do we diagnose heart failure so you can uh, i think i'm running short of time okay uh, uh, the oldest way to diagnose heart failure was based on the modified framingham criteria which in, gave more importance to clinical features but uh, unfortunately uh, if you look at it is the basic things that we do today like a bnp is not there in the guidelines so so this is just a clinical criteria but i just wanted to highlight here simply because the important things some things are important for example somebody loses 4.5 kg in 5 days of diuresis itself was considered as a evidence of uh, uh, heart failure so this was something which is uh, you know um, pretty old but uh, good to share so in clinical diagnosis of heart failure the important thing is uh, uh, the, that is uh, more to of a clinical diagnosis but in terms of management it is very important to decide what is the setting of the patient so the patient who is warm and dry so that is uh, cardiac output is good but the uh, you know both things are a couple may capillary vessel pressure is low those people are can be managed as outpatient just by increasing the diuretic so that is what we call as a compensated warm and dry the worst patients are people who are cold and dry so uh, dr venkatesh uh, sir will elaborate on the treatment alternatives but why i put up this chart is this is very important for somebody who is a, who is taking care of the patient in the er to decide which where the patient goes so for example the worst subset is cold and dry warm and wet is a very interesting subset because these people respond extremely well to treatment so treating warm and wet is exactly like treating hypoglycemia you know the patient is happy the doctor is happy the relatives are happy the tricky patients are what we call as the cold and dry patients because generally they don't look sick but uh, the, with treatment also they don't improve much so the dangerous subset would be the cold and dry the easiest would be warm and wet to treat the best prognosis would be warm and dry cold and wet would be somewhere in between so this is the uh, clinical uh, in terms of triage when patients get admitted with heart failure so this is just to uh, and skip all these things so what do you mean by uh, wet and uh, what do you mean by cold so this is just to uh, so this is very important so when when somebody has uh, acute heart failure should always look for decompensating factors for example acute coronary syndrome could be the commonest reason of decompensation so somebody has an anterior wall mi that could be the common thing patient presents with accelerated hypertension that could be the common reason patient has an uh, af with fast ventricular rate that could be the reason infection anemia anemia is not there in this list but all these things should go into your mind once somebody comes with heart failure so let's get all these things 
So basic investigation should be an EKG to look for evidence of ischemia, to look for evidence of conduction abnormality, look for tachyarrhythmia, look for atrial fibrillation, X-ray, blood test, echocardiogram. Obviously, echocardiogram is the basis of diagnosis of heart failure. Cardiac catheterization, MRI, all these things would be a key component. I'll skip all these things, but uh, now I'll jump to the last part of my talk is measuring DLP. So the Today, understand BNP is the basis of heart failure diagnosis. So, BNP is mandatory in diagnosis, so both in, both in prognosis as well as in um, deciding the line of management, diagnosis, prognosis, and follow-up. All these three scenarios, BNP is indicated. So, uh, we, this is uh, from pretty old study. But just to tell you that uh, people who have pre-discharged uh, BNP greater than seven, and that usually do not do well. So with treatment, if the BNP comes down, then these people do well. So this is the example of a uh, prognostication. So again, the consensus for heart failure diagnosis is patient presence with dyspnea. You do a physical examination, do an X-ray, do an ECG, do a BNP. If BNP is less than 100, do not even subject the patient to ECO. But BMP is 100 to 400. Then look at the clinical features, look at heart failure, uh, part 50, look at the probability of heart failure. And if BMP is more than 400, you can clearly assume that heart failure is the predominant. A short, uh, small word about uh, BMP and uh, NT pro BMP. You have to understand that NT pro BMP is significantly affected in uh, patients with renal function and also significantly affected with age. Other than that, both can be used interchangeably in most of the patients uh, to guide your clinical diagnosis. I think I'll stop here. I'm eating into other people's time. Sorry. Uh, Chetan sir, sir, you can take over, sir. And stop sharing. Yes, sir. Over to you, sir. I think Dr. Chetan Shah yeah. is not audible. Yeah. Uh, no problem. Sir, you can go ahead, sir. Very uh, good lecture, Dr. Manukar. Few important things. Uh, one of the slides you mentioned that mortality is uh, uh, about 50% after diagnosis, one year mortality. Female do worse than males. The most important uh, investigation and diagnosis of heart failure is 2D echocardiography, 2D echocardiography and 2D echocardiography. All the guidelines mention that, you know, most important uh, uh, tool in the diagnosis of heart failure is 2D echocardiography. And if not available, then uh, BNP or ND pro BNP. Uh, we will have questions uh, at the end of all three talks. I invite Dr. Venkatesh uh, for... Uh, uh, management of acute heart failure. So over to Dr. Venkatesh. Thank you very much. I'll be sharing the screen now. Yeah. And uh, am I? My is my screen uh, visible yes. now? Yes. yes sir. Sure. So good evening, everybody. And uh, good evening, moderator, Dr. Chetan Shah and uh, all the participants. It's a great pleasure. And I think uh, Dr. Manohar has done a wonderful job. He has comprehensively uh, told us about uh, heart failure. So that makes my job a little easier. And uh, there will be a little overlap as I put my point of view across. Of course, it's a global burden, and uh, we all saw from Dr. Manohar's slides that uh, it's a very uh, a kind of a situation which is associated with increased mortality, and uh, the mortality rates for heart failure patients remain high with 17 to 45 percent of deaths occurring within one year of diagnosis. So that way, if you compare cancer and if you compare heart failure, you find that heart failure probably does much worse than some of the cancers uh, compared where you have a decent five-year mortality. But for heart failure of certain types, the mortality is uh, a little dismal. Uh, 
and uh, Southeast Asian countries is uh, somehow the mortality and heart failure prevalence is more like in uh, China, Japan, Malaysia, Singapore, and of course, India. We have a mortality which ranges anywhere from about 1.3% to 6.7%. The heart failure definition, keeping it very simple, is to use the word complex. <laughs> so heart failure is a complex clinical syndrome that results from any structural or functional impairment of ventricular filling or ejection of blood. So you have more um, filling pressures and the heart is pumping blood. Even that is heart failure. And the reason why this definition came uh, was to include heart failure with preserved ejection fraction in the definition of heart failure. So classification of heart failure, once again, you have the ACC AHA classification and we try to correlate it with NYHA functional classification. And uh, basically the important thing to understand, we all know that it is classified as ABCD, but we should understand the rationale of A. See, in, our, in, the, in the ACC AHA stages of heart failure, if you look at A, it just says at high risk for heart failure, but without structural heart disease or symptoms of heart failure. Looks very funny. But then why is this brought in? It's important to understand this particular stage A heart failure and be proactive about its management because heart failure, once it sets in, is a progressive disease. We cannot use the word stable heart failure at any point of time. Heart failure is a progressive disease. There is no stability in heart failure. So it's very important that before the downward spiral begins, you have to identify the vulnerable group of people who are at high risk for heart failure, though there is no structural heart disease or symptoms of heart failure. Now, who are these people? These people are basically diabetics, hypertensives, and those due to some reason, either familial or non-familial, who have an increased propensity to get into that syndrome of heart failure. And that's exactly the reason why in this classification of ACC AHA, they have brought in stage A of heart failure. Well, types of heart failure reduced ejection fraction when the LVF is less than 40, and you have heart failure with preserved ejection fraction and the heart failure is more than 50. So what about people who have an ejection fraction between 40 to 49? So they are being classified as heart failure with mid-range ejection fraction. Now, it is important to categorize these kind of uh, people because if you ignore the patients who have mid-range ejection fraction between 40 to 49, remember, it is this group who have the highest mortality. Between heart failure with preserved ejection fraction and heart failure with reduced ejection fraction, if you ignore heart failure with mid-range ejection fraction, you tend to uh, you know, create a big chunk as far as the mortality is concerned. So these people are already downward spiraling and this is where you've got to be very aggressive in your management strategies. And that's one of the rationales of putting this middle column of heart failure with mid-range ejection fraction. What are the risk factors for heart failure? It's high blood pressure, lung problems, medical conditions as I already enumerated like diabetes, kidney disease, obesity, thyroid disorders, obstructive sleep apneas, and then, of course, infection, lifestyle, and heart problems. The symptoms and signs of typical heart failure have already been described. Well, the symptoms could be typical in the form of breathlessness, orthopnea, PND, reduced exercise tolerance, fatigue, tiredness, increased time to recover after exercise, and ankle swelling. These are all there. And the signs could be elevated jugular venous pressure, hepatojugular reflux, third heart sound, and laterally displaced apical impulse, which suggests that there is an enlargement of one of the ventricles. There could be some less typical symptoms and less specific signs as well. And uh, it's important to understand and pick up these patients who are at risk of developing heart failure. The pathogenic mechanisms for heart failure, again, irrespective of uh, the causes like arrhythmias or coronary artery disease or cardiomyopathy or valvular heart disease or exercise tolerance, you can see some subtle things like anemia, hyperthyroidism, vitamin B1 deficiency, all of them causing some kind of ventricular remodeling or they may be causing increasing congestion and volume overload. And there is this inflammatory component to heart failure as well. And uh, there could be heart failures which can sometimes cause increase in cardiac output, producing what is called as 
um, high output cardiac failure. So the pathogenic mechanisms of heart failure, as already discussed by Dr. Manohar, he has already put in the afterload and preload concepts. But more than the afterload and preload concepts, you have this uh, complex multitude, multifactorial causes of heart failure. It's very difficult to put your finger on one thing and say this is the cause of heart failure. In many of our patients, we find that a combination of factors could be responsible for the heart failure. Now, what's the diagnostic evaluation of heart failure? Well, diagnosing heart failure, of course, the classical triad of breathlessness, swollen limbs and fatigue is what a patient presents with as far as the symptoms are concerned. We got to be careful when we take the history, we need to include a history of other diseases, conduct a proper physical examination, and then go for some imaging studies, including echocardiogram and uh, ECG, of course, to assess the electrical activity of the heart and rule out arrhythmias. And then the blood tests, especially the cardiac biomarkers, markers of myocardial fibrosis. And of course, the most important thing as already enumerated uh, is uh, the BLP. So when you have a patient with suspected heart failure, you have to assess the probability of heart failure. As already mentioned, take a clinical history, do a physical examination, take an ECG, and you have those criteria. If there are none of these criteria, you still go for echocardiography, which if normal, then the diagnosis of heart failure is unlikely. But then if the echocardiography is abnormal, well, then we have to again find out what exactly is the cause of that abnormality and appropriately determine our strategy for treating the heart failure. Well, if more than one criteria is present, either in the clinical history, physical examination or ECG, well, it should uh, you know, make us uh, take a, a BNP study or NT-pro BNP study. And you have this cutoffs of NT-pro BNP diagnostic more than 125 and a BNP more than 35. And nowadays these tests BNP are done as a point of care testing quickly in the emergency uh, set in the emergency department. And that can help us to determine with an echocardiograph whether heart failure is present or not and also know about its history. A history and physical examination, you have a 1C recommendation that a thorough history and physical examination should be obtained and performed in patients presenting with heart failure to identify cardiac and non-cardiac disorders or behaviors that may cause or accelerate the development or progression of heart failure. And a 1C recommendation that in a patient with idiopathic dilated cardiomyopathy, you should take a three-generational family history. And a 1B classic, 1B recommendation that a volume status and vital sign should be assessed at each time that you see the patient. And there should also be a serial assessment of weight. And also we should examine the JVP and look for peripheral edema and orthopnea. These are coming in the guidelines of European Heart Journal. <laughs> And uh, when are we going to see the recommendations for biomarkers of heart failure? As I said, you have recommendations for natriuretic peptides, you have recommendations for myocardial injury, and you have recommendations for myocardial fibrosis. Yeah, thank you. So uh, the natriuretic peptides is uh, basically um, diagnosis or exclusion of heart failure. It has a level one A recommendation. Prognosis, again, uh, for heart failure, it has a one year recommendation. And to achieve guideline directed medical treatment, you have a two year recommendation. Now, biomarkers of myocardial injury like troponins and heart failure have a one year recommendation. And biomarkers of myocardial fibrosis, which we normally don't do in clinical practice, those are the uh, MMP1 and MMP2, matrix metalloprotease 1 and 2, which are basically indicators of myocardial fibrosis. We don't uh, normally do them and rightly so they have been given a class 2B indication. So for non-invasive imaging, it's important that uh, any patient with suspected acute or new onset heart failure should undergo a chest X-ray and should also undergo a 2D echocardiogram with Doppler and a repeat measurement of ejection fraction is important and this is given a class 1c indication. Well, as far as MRI, radionuclide ventriculography and then viability is concerned and non-invasive imaging to detect myocardial ischemia, uh, well, they are all given 2a recommendation. 
but routine repeat measurement of LV function should not be performed uh, in many situations because they do not give us any additional advantage. For invasive evaluation with monitoring of pulmonary artery catheter, uh, whenever there is any respiratory distress or impaired systemic perfusion, and if you find that the clinical assessment for some reason is inadequate, let's say for example, a patient comes to you, he has heart failure and on top of that, there's an overlying factor like he's got severe vomiting and diarrhea, which is going to alter his uh, heart space uh, dynamics. And you're not very sure what you're looking at, whether to hydrate him, whether not to hydrate him. And when your ultrasound imaging of the inferior vena cava is uh, not a very reliable option due to the presence of an associated tricuspid regurgitation or pulmonary hypertension, and you really do not know what to do. Then, of course, at that point of time, a right heart catheterization with a pulmonary artery catheter is going to come in handy and is going to let you know the level at which you should probably be hydrating him and how careful you should be when you want to give uh, your fluids. Well, there are a number of uh, calculators uh, to calculate the risk scores and to predict outcomes in heart failure. And uh, these are available in the uh, applications on, you can download them from Google. And uh, they always uh, let you know uh, the predictable mortality, morbidity, survival, etc. And there are a number of uh, uh, heart failure calculators that have been developed both for chronic heart failure and acutely decompensated heart failure. Now, when you look at the overall management of heart failure, as I said, there are stage A, stage B, stage C, and stage D uh, indicators and stages. So each of these stages we need to probably uh, deal with separately and we have to make sure that the downward spiral which happens in progressive heart failure is halted. I know this is a very busy slide and this is only some kind of a tabletop, uh, uh, you know, you can keep it in your, uh, uh, in a place where things are handy for you and uh, probably it's a guide to make sure that you don't miss out on any of the pathways that are um, existent as a patient goes from stage A to stage B or from stage B to stage C. But uh, overall, uh, you know, there are certain broad guidelines as to how we should be managing and uh, how we can uh, actually prevent or delay the development of overt heart failure. Um, or rather reduce the mortality even before the onset of symptoms. Well, it basically boils down to, if you can look at all the one-year recommendations, you can see that you need to treat hypertension, you need to treat uh, with statins, especially in those who are at high risk of coronary artery disease. These are all things which are very familiar to us and which we keep doing in our day-to-day -day practice, nothing big about it. And smoking cessation and alcohol intake reduction is recommended for people who smoke or who consume excess alcohol. And this is an important step to prevent or delay the onset of heart failure. So uh, we give a little importance to this, but uh, I think more importance should be given because in spite of institution proactively uh, of certain measures to control the risk factors, if the patient continues to smoke or if the patient continues to um, consume alcohol, then he is definitely at a greater risk of rapidly developing uh, heart failure. And of course, certain... Uh, uh, drugs like uh, empagliflozin should be considered in type 2 diabetes mellitus to prevent or delay the onset of heart failure and prolonged life. It is given a class 2 year recommendation. And AC inhibitors again have been given a class 1 year recommendation, especially in those with asymptomatic LV systemic dysfunction and with a history of myocardial infarction. So they prevent uh, LV remodeling and thereby uh, prevent uh, the onset of heart failure. And uh, beta blockers have also been recommended in patients with asymptomatic LV systolic dysfunction and a history of myocardial infarction in order to prevent or delay the onset of heart failure. There are certain other non-pharmacological methods also to prevent sudden cardiac death in patients with uh, heart failure and especially with a prior history of myocardial infarction. And if the ejection fraction continues to remain less than 30%, even after 40 days after an acute MI, then these are the candidates who uh, would benefit a lot by implantation of an implantable cardioverter defibrillator to prevent sudden cardiac death. So management of stage A basically boils down to management of risk factors like hypertension, lipid disorders, diabetes, obesity, tobacco use, cardiotoxic agents. So they are all given class 1A and class 1C recommendation and it forms a very, very important part of treatment of uh, patients in stage A. In stage B, again, you have uh, 
a big green there, especially again, I emphasize upon the AC inhibitors, the beta blockers, statins, and uh, uh, proper and controlled management of blood pressure, use of AC inhibitors and beta blockers. So in stage B, of course, an ICD uh, is a class 2A indication. If the ejection fraction is less than 30% in somebody who's had an MI, and at 40 days, his ejection fraction continues to remain less than 30%. Well, they uh, have given a class three harm to non dihydropyridine calcium channel blockers. And uh, especially with low left ventricular ejection fraction, it's uh, uh, very tricky and you may cause harm uh, and even death when you use uh, non dihydropyridine calcium channel blockers because they have a negative anotropic effect. Well, um, non pharmacological intervention in state C heart failure is always, of course, the health education, which is very, very important for all persons. It's, uh, you know how to uh, control his fluid intake and he will have his fluid restrictions more than one liter more than 1.2 liter or 800 ml these are the kind of uh, uh, fluid restrictions which are going to place exercise training is something you got to work on sodium restriction continuous positive airway pressure can be beneficial to increase left ventricular ejection fraction and improve functional status in patients with heart failure and sleep apnea especially in those with sleep apnea uh, where CPAP plays a very important role in many a times reversing the pulmonary artery pressure or reducing the pulmonary artery pressure in addition to the other measures that you use. And many a times we have seen that patients uh, uh, improve after CPAP as far as the heart failure hemodynamics are concerned. So uh, pharmacological treatment, again, um, AC inhibitors are ARB and beta blockers. And when I say this, uh, please also remember ARNI because now it is clearly established that whenever a patient is uh, AC inhibitor or angiotensin receptor blocker eligible, ARNI should be considered. And uh, this is a very important uh, thing. And of course, in all uh, patients with heart failure, you will also consider using a beta blocker. So the other important thing is the pharmacological treatments in selected patients with symptomatic NYHA class two to four. I know this is a very busy chart, but uh, I'll just enumerate the kind of choices you have, or rather the therapeutic armamentarium that we have, wherein we can make use of these drugs um, to medically manage these patients anywhere from class two to class four. They are diuretics. Diuretics, they uh, do not have any mortality benefit but still they improve the quality of life. And then of course the ARNI, that is angiotensin receptor neprosilin inhibitor, which has been shown to have uh, by the paradigm heart failure study, mortality benefit. And so our threshold should be uh, very high before we stop ARNI. If there is some mild hyperkalemia, we should try to continue to give uh, ARNI by um, controlling the potassium by low potassium containing diet. And also you can use some uh, potassium binding agents and uh, up to a serum potassium level of 5.9, you can probably uh, manage them clinically and continue with army. And of course, ivapredine uh, is another drug which is uh, very promising and it has got a class 2A indication. And uh, ARB and AC inhibitors, I already uh, said that they belong to class 1B and now army has entered its place. If a patient is considered to be eligible for AC inhibitor or an ERB, we try to give ARNI. The other drugs which we have is hydrolysine and isosorbide dinitrate, digoxin. And uh, digoxin is one drug uh, where we are a little uh, skeptical, but in heart failure, it may be considered in symptomatic patients, especially if they are in sinus rhythm. Uh, and uh, along with an AC inhibitor or a beta blocker, and a mineral, mineralocorticoid receptor antagonist is very important to be uh, looked at in patients who have heart failure. Probably after diuretics, you will add, uh, that is after loop diuretics, you will add a thiazide-like diuretic like metalazone. And then your next choice probably is going to be a mineralocorticoid receptor antagonist. So this is how it runs the potassium. As I was saying, I think I went ahead in the slide and you have the loop diuretics, then comes the thiazide diuretics. You can consider uh, hydrochlorothiazide or metalazone, and of course, the potassium sparing diuretic like spironolactone, that's epilirinone and amyloride, and triamtrine, of course. Well, AC inhibitor, beta blockers, and an MRA come to class 1A level whenever a patient is in class 2 to class 4 in heart failure with ejection fraction. So, this is some kind of uh, 
um, this is some kind of a recommendation that uh, we should all follow. And uh, uh, whenever I say AC inhibitor or an ARB, I into bracket always think of ARNI because in patients who um, are eligible for ARB and uh, AC, ARNI should come in and they all have a class 1A level of indication. And this is something that you should be using in patients with heart failure. Well, uh, as far as heart failure with preserved ejection fraction and mid-rate ejection fraction is concerned, it is recommended to screen patients for both cardiovascular and non-cardiovascular comorbidities. And uh, we need to intervene uh, in such uh, situations and improve the quality of life of uh, these people and also improve the prognosis, which is given a class 1C recommendation. And diuretics, of course, are recommended in congested patients with heart failure with preserved ejection fraction and heart failure with mid-range ejection fraction in order to alleviate symptoms and signs. As we move along in this webinar, we shall open up the topic of using of RD in patients uh, who are in mid-range ejection fraction. Probably our moderator, Dr. Chetan Shah, is going to throw some light on that. Because in the paradigm heart failure trial, we had um, uh, you know, studies concentrating on LVF is less than 40%. So that's going to be an interesting uh, uh, correlate. And this again is probably a repeat slide of how we need to go across in the algorithm. Uh, An AC inhibitor and the beta blocker is always there. And um, then uh, our uh, need for non-pharmacological measures are also highlighted in this slide, wherein if you have a sinus rhythm and a QRS duration of more than 130 milliseconds, we have to consider cardiac resynchronization therapy. And uh, of course, if the sinus rhythm and heart rate more than 70 per minute, there is ivabradin also coming in to improve the uh, mortality statistics. Uh, recommendations for treatment of hypertension in patients with symptomatic heart failure with reduced, reduced rejection fraction, nothing much different here. At all stages, it's important to uh, control the hypertension. As far as hospitalized patients are concerned, well, this is slightly an outdated slide, but uh, now we have some recent uh, things coming on that even in hospitalized patients, if they are in the ICU and uh, if they are hemodynamically stable for 48 to 72 hours, as shown in the transition study, and if they are AC inhibitor or ARB eligible, we may probably need to give them ARNI. And of course, here again, we talk about AC inhibitors and ARBs, fluid restriction, and uh, prevention of uh, treatment of overload. And at hospital discharge, we should make sure that our uh, discharge medications are appropriate and that we are giving them a guideline directed medical therapy at all times. So this is a complex health journey for patients with heart failure. They move from the emergency room to the family physician, to the heart failure clinic. And it's for us to uh, pick up these patients very carefully optimize their treatment. And now um, to make things simple, we have some nurses who are uh, heart failure educators and uh, they make frequent phone calls to the patients, asking them to monitor the weight, record their weight. So that's where telemedicine is coming up in a big way. And um, you, we have also daycare facilities for looking after them. And uh, if there is some worsening and they have a device inside, we have certain technologies called OptiWall, et cetera, which tells us that they're fluid overloaded. So this is a complex area. And uh, I think uh, I will end my talk here uh, with the saying that uh, it's important to tell our patients to carefully monitor their health. Secondly, try to keep them um, in such a way, in other words, manage them in such a way where they don't slide down very fast in their uh, progressive deterioration of heart failure. And uh, it is important to have a one-to-one -one interaction with many of our patients and monitor for those deteriorating signs very quickly and appropriate, uh, uh, you know, reflexly appropriately measure and monitor their uh, symptoms and dole out the medical treatment. So thank you very much for this patient listening. Over to you, Dr. Chetan. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Venkatesh. Uh, uh, we'll be discussing the questions uh, at the end of uh, all the talks. So I'll, I'll share screen and start my presentation. Sure, sir, please. 
Sir, you need to close the screen, sir. Yeah, I did that. I did that. So is it visible, my slides? Yes, yes, sir. Yes, sir. Very yes, much sir. visible. Yes, sir. So uh, let's start with my presentation after two very good talks of Dr. Manokar and Dr. Venkatesh. My focus here uh, is uh, going to be on the management, prevention and management of chronic heart failure. And the presentation is based on uh, these guidelines and this recommendation. Uh, there was a very interesting um, beginning in 2018 guidelines from Cardiac Society of Australia and New Zealand, which you know, just in the beginning of the guidelines, they said, uh, what about the prevention of heart failure? And they had given these three recommendations about the prevention of heart failure, blood pressure and lipid lowering according to the established, uh, according to the published guidelines are recommended to decrease the risk of cardiovascular events and developing heart failure. So that is very important, blood pressure and lipid lowering according to the established uh, and published guidelines. SGLT2 inhibitors. SGLT2 inhibitors are recommended in patients with type 2 diabetes mellitus associated with cardiovascular disease and insufficient glycemic control despite metformin to decrease the risk of cardiovascular events and decrease the risk of heart failure hospitalization. And thirdly, angiotensin converting enzyme inhibitors are recommended in patients with LV systolic dysfunction to decrease the risk of developing heart failure. So this one, two, and three important messages for prevention of heart failure, blood pressure and lipid lowering as per the guidelines, SGLD2 inhibitors and ACE inhibitors. And we have a lot of trials recently with these SGLD2 inhibitors. Uh, the Emparex study with empagliflozin, the Canva study with canagliflozin and Diclatimib 58 study with dapagliflozin. So all these trials have shown that SGLT2 inhibitors are much better than placebo for hospitalization, for CHI, for cardiovascular death. Recently, there was a DAPA-HF trial and what the DAPA-HF trial did was DAPA-HF trial uh, 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 tried dapagliflozin 10 milligram per day versus placebo in patients with uh, heart failure and reduced ejection fraction irrespective of their diabetes. EF was less than 40% and uh, the one on dapagliflozin did significantly better as far as primary outcome was concerned that was cardiovascular death, hospitalization for heart failure, urgent heart failure visits. 16.3% uh, versus 21.2%. The secondary outcome were also better. That was cardiovascular death with dapagliflozin. And they concluded that among patients with heart failure and a reduced ejection fraction, the risk of worsening heart failure or death from cardiovascular causes was lower among those who received dapagliflozin than among those who received placebo regardless of the presence or absence of diabetes. So this was extremely important. Um, now, management of patients with <clears throat> heart failure with chronic uh, heart failure with reduced ejection fraction as already this slide has been seen. But let me go through this slide again. Patients with symptomatic heart failure, therapy with ACE inhibitors and beta blockers, the most important part of the treatment, up to right rate to the maximum tolerated evidence-based doses. If the patient is still symptomatic, EF less than 35%, add mineralocorticoid receptor antagonist, up titrate to maximum tolerated evidence-based dose. If the patient is still symptomatic and EF less than 35%, then we have uh, three options, able to tolerate AC inhibitors or ARBs, then give ARMI. If patient has sinus rhythm, QRS duration of 130, um, then consider CRT, cardiac resynchronization therapy. And if the patient has sinus rhythm, in spite of beta blocker therapy, maintaining a heart rate of more than 70, then we have evabradin. So we have this ARNI. A lot has been talked about ARNI, paradigm HF trial. Uh, 
in which uh, army was tried in ambulatory symptomatic heart failure patients with reduced ejection fraction uh, they were already treated with ac inhibitors or arbs uh, they were able to tolerate treatment with enalapril they had uh, elevated plasma np levels and estimated gfr was uh, more than 30 Now, ARNI has also been used in uh, patients with acute heart failure in Pioneer HF study. Ivabradin, uh, again, Ivabradin is indicated in patients with heart failure with symptomatic uh, uh, symptoms and sinus rhythm with heart rate of more than seventy. So, as uh, we have already seen, diuretics to relieve the symptoms of congestion. If uh, LVF less than 35 and patient has symptomatic VTVF or uh, resuscitated cardiac arrest, implant and implantable cardioverter defibrillator, we have talked about ARNI. We have talked. Of, we will talk about CRT, ibuprofen. If the patient is still symptomatic, then we can consider DIG or hydralazine isocyanide dinitrate combination, uh, left ventricular assist device, and finally heart transplantation. so what is the difference between the 2019 uh, accha guidelines and the guidelines from from european society of cardiology for management of acute and chronic heart failure so these were the differences in the guidelines accha said that you know ace inhibitor instead of ace specific arb can be used and beta blockers can be used up front and arni for ace inhibitors or arbs For NYHA class two and three symptoms without without trying ACE inhibitors or ARBs. So this was very important point. ARMI can be used straight away in patients with heart failure. What did the ACHA guidelines uh, say? Uh, they said that ACE inhibitors and or ARBs and beta blockers and ARMI for persistent symptoms despite triple neurohormonal blockade. and they had broader indication for ivabradin you know ivabradin was much uh, more stressed in european guidelines patients who cannot tolerate beta blockers patient have contraindication for beta blockers and patients who are already are on beta blockers but the heart rate is more than 70 now dig uh, the what do the guidelines say for dig digital is only recommended for treatment of patients with heart failure with Reduced ejection fraction and atrial fibrillation with rapid ventricular rate when other therapeutic options cannot be pursued. Important thing: DIG should always be prescribed under special supervision. Caution should be exerted in females, in the elderly, and in patients with reduced renal function. What are the core recommendations? The recommendations for the treatment of other comorbidities in patients with heart failure. So, two most important thing: one for iron deficiency. intravenous ferric carboxymaltase should be considered in symptomatic patients with heart failure with reduced ejection fraction and iron deficiency that is serum ferritin less than 100 uh, and if it's between 100 and 299 transferrin saturation less than 20 in order to alleviate heart failure symptoms and improve exercise capacity and quality of life so again very important thing uh, in my personal opinion also iron deficiency is extremely common in patients with heart failure and they have definitely improved with intravenous ferric carboxymaltase these are the patients many times who have normal hemoglobin normal hematocrit but uh, less serum ferritin and uh, they have improved with uh, intravenous ferric carboxymaltase uh, guidelines for diabetes metformin should be considered as a first line therapy uh, for the treatment of glycemic control in patients with diabetes and heart failure and unless contraindicated what are the treatments which are not recommended or of unproven benefit in symptomatic patients with heart failure with reduced ejection fraction so renin inhibitors are not recommended at all now there was a question uh, by uh, one of the audience uh, doctors that what about statins so evidence does not support the initiation of statin in most patients Uh, with chronic heart failure without coronary artery disease so if there is called a coronary artery disease then statins are a must uh, but if there is no coronary artery disease the evidence does not support initiation of statins what about anticoagulation and antiplatelet therapy so i have a word antiplatelet therapy uh, are not recommended at all 
um, in patients without uh, accompanying coronary artery disease. Um, now, as far as your anticoagulants are concerned, there was a trial recently um, in JAMA Cardiology Association of Rivaroxaban with thromboembolic events in patients with heart failure, coronary disease, and a sinus rhythm. And this was a post hoc analysis of Commander HF trial. And the conclusion was in this study, the thromboembolic events occurred frequently in patients with heart failure, CAD, and sinus rhythm. Rivaroxaban may reduce the risk of thromboembolic events in this population, but these events are not a major cause of morbidity and mortality in this patient with recent worsening heart failure for which rivaroxaban 2.5 milligram BD in order to standard treatment had no effect. So, you know, uh, rivaroxaban has been tried in uh, chronic coronary artery disease patients, in peripheral arterial disease patients, uh, but um, this uh, uh, post hoc analysis or subgroup analysis of heart failure patient commander HF trial did not find any benefit in this particular group of patients. Now, uh, Tafamidis has been recently approved uh, by FDA for treatment of transthyretin mediated cardiomyopathy. That is, uh, uh, this is amyloid cardiomyopathy. Uh, there was a study in New England Journal of Medicine, and uh, they concluded that in patients with transthyretin amyloid cardiomyopathy, tafamidis was associated with reduction in all cause mortality and cardiovascular related hospitalization and reduced the decline in functional capacity and quality of life as compared to placebo. Following that, in May 2019, FDA has approved this particular drug uh, for uh, treatment of transthyretin mediated cardiomyopathy. Treatment that may cause harm. It's important to know what treatment will cause harm in this particular group of patients. And glitazones. Glitazones are not recommended in patients with heart failure as they increase the risk of heart failure, worsening and heart failure hospitalization. Non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs and COX-2 inhibitors. Again, they increase the risk of heart failure, worsening and heart failure hospitalization. Diltiazem and varapamil are not recommended in patients with heart failure reduce ejection fraction as they increase the risk of heart failure worsening and heart failure hospitalization. And in addition of ARB, in addition to ACE inhibitor or MRB is not recommended at all because of increased risk of renal dysfunction and hyperkalemia. Uh, what about recommendations for ICD, secondary, recommend, secondary prevention? I think there is uh, no controversy. It's a class 1A recommendation. All those patients who had VT, VF, resuscitated cardiac arrest, uh, they need uh, an implantable cardioverter defibrillator. What about primary prevention? All the patients with EF less than 35 uh, with symptomatic heart failure and more than three months of optimal medical treatment and are expected to survive for more than one year. Uh, ICD is recommended in ischemic heart disease uh, who have myocardial infarction for more than 40 days and patients with dilated cardiomyopathy. What about uh, recommendations for cardiac resynchronization therapy? So both ACCH and EAC guidelines have said that CRT is recommended for symptomatic patients with heart failure and sinus rhythm with QRS duration of more than 150 and LBBB QRS morphology with EF less than 35 despite optimal medical treatment to improve symptoms and reduce morbidity and mortality. So this is class one recommendation. What about uh, QRS duration of more than 150 non-LBBB morphology? So ACCHA guidelines say class two a recommendation uh, for NYHA functional class three and to be recommendation for functional class two. Whereas the European Society of Cardiology as class 2A recommendation for this particular group of patients. And what about CRP therapy for intermediate QRS duration? So class 2B recommendation for QRS duration of 120 to 149, this is LBBB morphology, and 130 to 149 class 1 recommendation by ESC guidelines. Now there has been a uh, mitra clip for functional mitral regurgitation, FDA approves mitral clip for the use of heart failure patients with severe functional mitral regurgitation. Now, this is a tran transcatheter device now indicated for patients with degenerative or functional mitral regurgitation. Uh, 
what about the role of catheter ablation uh, for atrial fibrillation with heart failure so catheter ablation for atrial fibrillation in patients with heart failure was associated with a significant lower rate of composite end point of death from any cause or hospitalization for worsening heart failure then was medical therapy cabg now uh, patients with heart failure with coronary artery disease um, and correctable uh, surgically correctable coronary artery disease uh, with viable myocardium uh, they should be definitely considered for cabg what about wall surgery so we are talking about patients with severe aortic stenosis and severe aortic regurgitation and all these patients should undergo surgical aortic valve replacement now in patients who are not operable the aortic stenosis patients who are not operable or or who are at very high risk for surgical aortic valve replacement should be considered for transcatheter uh, aortic valve implantation as per this guidelines uh if nothing works then we have a uh, ventricular assist device uh, and this implantation should be considered in patients with intractable severe heart failure despite guideline directed medical therapy and crt and who do not uh, suffer from any major comorbidities to decrease the mortality and all this does not uh, uh, work then we have last option as cardiac transplantation now there are what are the recent updates in management of patients with heart failure with preserved ejection fraction and uh, if we look at this 2019 guidelines heart failure with preserved ejection fraction and diabetes or high blood pressure accs got no recommendation specific recommendation but guideline directed medical therapy uh, blood pressure systolic blood pressure less than 130 uh, european guidelines say metformin for initial diabetic control and step care approach with uh, guideline directed medical therapy for hypertension uh, now recently there was a paragon hr study which tried arni in the patients who had failure with preserved ejection fraction this was uh, late 2019 october 2019 new england journal of medicine publication uh, what it concluded was that sacubitral valsartan did not result in a significantly low rate of total hospitalization for heart failure and death on cardiovascular causes among the patients with heart failure and ejection fraction of 45% or higher now we have couple of more trial there is a deliver trial that is dapagliflozin evaluation to improve the lives of patients with preserved ejection fraction heart failure so uh, this is going to be trying uh, dapagliflozin 10 mg versus placebo in this particular group of patients and we have emperor preserve trial Uh, which is going to be using alpagliflozin 10 mg versus placebo in patients with heart failure with preserved ejection fraction so what do we do for heart failure with preserved ejection fraction so as guidelines have said uh, proper control of hypertension systolic blood pressure should be less than 130 we can use sglt2 inhibitors and lifestyle modification is extremely important in all these patients and to end with i land with the national institute for healthcare excellence that is nice guidelines which provides national guidance and advice to the to improve the health and social care in england and you know as the slide suggest they exactly do the do the same thing these are the guidelines you know i want you to know read it very interestingly that nt pro bnp more than 2000 then the patient this is england the patient should be urgently referred within 2 weeks urgently referred within 2 weeks to a specialist heart failure specialist and if nt pro bnp is between 400 to 2000 refer urgently to be seen within 6 weeks 6 weeks so heart failure patients in england are being seen uh, the urgent referral in 2 weeks and semi urgent referral in 6 weeks i think we are extremely much better off in our country as as england you know they properly they, they they deserve this you know as brexit they deserve they deserve it and one of the drugs uh, in england has said that you know heart failure sucks so i i i end my presentation here thank you very much uh, and i i will ask all the speakers to unmute their uh, um to unmute themselves and let's let's have the questions
Yeah, that was an excellent presentation, sir. Thank you. Thank you very much. So, so the last the slide is so good. Uh, about the statin therapy, one I've already answered. That is there any indication for statin for patients who are not having coronary artery disease? Um, what is your opinion, Dr. Manokar, Dr. Venkatesh? Um, sir, uh, uh, if you look at the guidelines, uh, the, the trials that you mentioned clearly say that there is no role of uh, statins in people without CAD. Uh, and another interesting thing is even in CKD, the guidelines are uh, saying that uh, till CKD stage 4 uh, and coexisting heart failure or whatever, statins have some role. So statin, stage 5 CKD, statins are detrimental. So maybe there is something... Uh, same, uh, we can apply to heart failure also. So, if somebody doesn't have CAD, doesn't have any underlying CAD, I think statins are, you can confidently omit statins because the symptomatology in heart failure is worsened by high dose statins. So, we can take a stand that statin should not be given unless there's a proven underlying CAD in the patient. I think that's how we should take it uh, as a guideline. Correct. I think... Another uh, question, Dr. Venkatesh. Uh, yeah, uh, my take on this would be basically yeah, yeah. whatever uh, statin trials have happened in heart failure have been with uh, two important trials called uh, Corona trial and the GC heart failure trial, if I'm not mistaken. And they uh, actually studied patients uh, on systolic heart failure. And uh, there was this concept that uh, when you have a lower LDL cholesterol and there is a heart failure, the mortality is high. So they were homing into two aspects of the whole thing. Suppose a patient already has got an LDL cholesterol, uh, which is uh, well below your cutoff value and he is in heart failure, don't give him statins. At the same time, in the presence of atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease, uh, to prevent the further progression of atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease to cause heart failure, they said, try to give statins as much as possible. So, if a patient with atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease has heart failure, it is preferable to continue statin. If a patient has got non-atherosclerotic cardiovascular cause as a cause of his heart failure, and if you find that the LDL cholesterol is well uh, below the cutoff values, well, I think it is uh, better not to initiate statins. That is my take on this. Based on this uh, study of these uh, two trials, mainly the uh, corona trial and uh, this GC heart failure trial. Perfect. Uh, another question to Dr. Venkatesh uh, about uh, ARNI in acute heart failure. So there is a question yes. about role of ARNI in acute heart failure. Will you give them in patients who are there in the ICU? Yes, ARNI in acute heart failure is a very interesting concept. Earlier, what we used to do was not to initiate ARNI for the fear of causing hypotension in the ICUs. But now, after the results of the transition trial have come, uh, what we believe is in uh, that after 48 to 72 hours, if the patient has maintained a systolic blood pressure of more than 100 millimeters of mercury without there being need for any inotropic support, then he can be considered as an eligible candidate for initiation of ARNI. Of course, when we begin the dose of ARNI, we should make sure that we check his creatinine, we check his potassium, and we closely watch them for development of hypotension and their tolerance to ARNI. Just like when you start an AC inhibitor or an ERB, you've got to make sure that they are tolerant to these drugs. So in the same way, ARNI is nothing but an ERB containing drug. So we have to make sure that a hypotension does not develop. And the transition trial has clearly shown that when you start ARNI, 48 to 72 hours after hemodynamic stabilization in the ICU, it is as safe as when you start it post-discharge. So, uh, there is another question here that will you give it uh, before discharge, on discharge or before discharge? Like I said, you can give it as per the recent trial data, you can give it in the ICU as you are trying to shift the patient out of the ICU. If he has remained 48 hours hemodynamically stable, well, please don't deprive him of an ARNI because early initiation of ARNI is also equally important 
with respect to reducing the mortality and morbidity in this heart failure patient because rd is considered to be a milestone molecule in the management of heart failure and it has mortality benefits reduction of mortality happens when you give this rd there are very few drugs earlier we only had ac inhibitors or angiotensin receptor blockers beta blockers and mrnas these were the only three class of drugs which we had in our therapeutic armamentarium for management of heart failure when you look at their translation to mortality and morbidity but now we have this very important drug uh, which is acting on the bnp system where you can further reduce the mortality in this patient so we should have a keenness a kind of a desire to start this molecule as early as possible once the clinical situation permits and the transition trial has clearly shown that uh, this is quite possible there is another question for dr manokar what yes. is the role of uh, mri for the uh, heart failure patients uh, as uh, dr venkatesh sir rightly pointed out it's a class 2 indication for estimating the level of scar burden uh, but in our own clinical practice since we have a uh, uh, guy trained in mri for the last 10 years in our institute we have been doing mri almost for every undiagnosed heart failure from maybe 2010 onwards so mri in our institute we have been doing mri for patients who come with unexplained heart failure even in patients with where ischemic etiology is suspected we tend to do the mri before the angiogram but uh, all heart failure patients at some point of time whenever the decision making is involved for example somebody has a regurgitation which is doubtful you are not very sure whether that regurgitation is explaining explaining the heart failure we go for right. mri whenever you think that patient has something where you have to make a decision on uh, whether the viability is there whether the patient should go for a cabg or ptc or medical management or transplant we have used mri whenever we have had a scenario where we had to decide whether the icd is recommended and the uh, family is not very convinced of primary prevention we have looked at scar burden the third scenario is special case scenarios wherever we have looked at amyloidosis or some cases of sarcoidosis where we have used mri to make our decisions but uh, unlike our own institutional practice the guidelines are uh, recommending it as a class 2a indication especially to look at scar burden in patients with heart failure so uh, the recommendations are class 2a but if you take our own institutional experience we have done close to 500 mris in the last 10 years for patients with suspected heart failure uh, both for etiological diagnosis both for risk stratification prognostication and treatment plan so in our institute we have used mri extensively but the recommendations as per the guidelines are class 2a and that is mainly for etiology and scar uh, quantification there is one more question here by dr rajkumar datta from kolkata if heart failure patient is on army uh, do the use of statin reduce the effectiveness of army well i think uh, they are two separate drugs and uh, well statins are given with a different purpose in mind and arni is given with a different purpose in mind and uh, i think arni will be an anchor molecule for heart failure and um, i think uh, there is no harm in continuing uh, statins with the kivets that we have already uh, discussed if it is a ldl cholesterol which is uh, probably very low and uh, uh you have a non atherosclerotic uh, cause for heart failure then that's probably the time when you can withhold uh, statins okay so i think uh, uh, uh there are no more questions uh, uh, thank you very much dr manokar thank you very much dr venkatesh uh, thank you sir important thing you know one thing i like uh, in this uh, uh, diagnosis and etiology of acute heart failure now i always like the word cham c h a m p and that cham acronym uh, they say is very important in all the patients with acute heart failure in order to find out the etiology where c c stands for cardiac etiology h stands for hypertension a stands for arrhythmia m stands for mechanical cause and p stands for pulmonary embolism so i would you know want to end with this cham thing that cham thing should be kept in mind in all patients with heart failure when they uh, 
when they present to you for the first time. So thank you very much, Dr. Venkatesh. Thank you very much, Dr. Manokar. I hand over to Avinash thank for you, Thanksgiving remarks. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thanks, thank you. Thanks a lot, sir. Nice point to thank take you, up, sir. sir. Champ, champion yeah, point. Champ, champ is a good point. Yeah, very runners good. always like that champ thing. Yes, sir. Thank you, sir. Yeah. Once again. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Once again, a very good evening to you all. Uh, I am personally grateful to today's moderator as well as the speakers, Dr. Chetan Shah, sir, Dr. Venkatesh, sir, as well as Dr. Manokar, sir, for a wonderful deliberation on heart failure. It was indeed a treat to listen to them. I am also thankful to all you viewers from all across the country for logging in for this today's webinar. My sincere gratitude to you all. A big thank you from Team IPCA. Stay well, take care. Thanks a lot, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Bye.